Greetings everyone, this is Anthony Anderson. This is the first installment of the Anthony Anderson Show. I'm here with my great friend, Edward Gell. Hello, I'm Ed. And we're just gonna be uh, talking shop for a little bit. This is the first installment, so gonna be giving you kind of a, an intro into what I've been up to, my, my brief story, just lay a little foundation, and then we're just gonna talk about some things that we're up to these days. Great, that sounds awesome, and uh, I know that you just got back from California. Yeah. And you were in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. All kinds of places. Um, as uh, obviously, a, a lot of people are are just watching Anthony for the first time, and uh, he's really into a lot of different things uh, that I'm really excited about as well. Yeah. And but you're very knowledgeable about it. Uh, tell us, you know, do your intro to the world. <laughs> My story, in a nutshell, was. Um, you know, middle class, growing up, no big deal. Um, started going to school, uh, finished college with a business marketing degree. As I was about to graduate, I had a chance to go to Paris and live in Paris as a model for about a year. And then at that moment, I just had so much more free time. I wasn't watching television. I was just reading books and journaling. And I just had this huge opening where I just, all these ideas started flowing in. I started caring about what I was eating, started caring about like the, the earth, the environment. It, it, it was funny. It's like once the distractions went away, the ideas started flowing in. And what was nice is that all that kind of lifestyle stuff about living consciously with the, with the clean food and, and exercise, it was really good for my modeling career where I started working like a lot more. And I took it to another level once I moved to New York in 2004. And then I was really starting to book some serious jobs. I, got, I was in Times Square with billboards, really good commercials. And then using that as a tool, I'm trying to get people into conscious living, eating, eating right, you know, eating clean, growing their own food, and the idea of replanting paradise on earth through planting fruit trees and nut trees everywhere. Yeah, that's great. And I know that you've been a key component in my life to help me switch more towards a raw diet. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate that from you yeah. uh, and all the different things that you've taught me um, and teach everyone. I know your blog and your YouTube videos are all about that teaching mm -hmm. and and for those of you that don't know, you know, that's what uh, Only One TV is all about. It's about helping people, educating, and, uh, and, and it's exactly what you're all about, which is yeah. conscious living. Yeah. Uh, what, what is it that you say? Lifestyle for beauty? Yeah, the lifestyle for beauty. I mean, yeah. we're just trying to speed up the evolution of humanity as quick as possible, getting the information out there. And with the internet, it's really such a blessing where these ideas yeah. can spread. It's very democratic. People can just pull what they want, you know, and... And it's really, it's really an amazing time in history to be sharing yeah. these kind of ideas. I mean, yeah. back in the 70s or 60s, people were thinking about these things too, but maybe the, the technology wasn't appropriate and the ideas couldn't spread as much. So we're at a really uh, crucial time right now. It's yeah. perfect. I know, it's awesome. And I'm so happy that we have this network to be able to even expand it even further. Mm -hmm. But first, let's not forget our sponsors. I'd like to mention them uh, quickly. Our first sponsor is usgoldcoins.com. And they are our trusted source uh, to buy numismatic silver and gold coins. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can uh, call them is the best way to get your silver and gold. The number's on the screen. And they also have a website, uh, usgoldcoins.com. And also, uh, mezigrill.com, which they're uh, Mediterranean uh, food. And they're in Midtown Manhattan. And uh, they so graciously sponsor uh, a lot of our shows and they have great food as well also carpe vm um, they are a video marketing company and they will uh, basically create videos for you uh, and uh, and basically their their whole strategy is to promote your brand and market it in a video format mm -hmm. and also we have uh, tradehill.com which is a bitcoin exchanger and for those of you that don't know what Bitcoins are, they are the new form of currency on the internet. They are microcurrency uh, and uh, TradeHill.com is uh, one of the new kids on the block and they do exchange from US dollars to Bitcoins and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And also MountGox.com uh, is our other sponsor and they also are the oldest kid on the block for Bitcoin and they are also an exchanger. And um, check it out, Bitcoins, 
uh, we created a site called BitcoinMe.com, and you can find out all about what Bitcoins are. And those are our sponsors. So, uh, Anthony, uh, you just got back to New York, and yeah. we're so happy that you're here Me to too. help us and, uh, and to launch your new show. We're excited yeah. to hear all the new things that you have and that you've done. And, uh, it's amazing what you do in a short period of time. Uh, <laughs> tell us, I know that you're very passionate about your sustained agriculture, and mm. tell the audience what that's all about. Uh, it's really about kind of emulating nature. And if we look at the two sides of the spectrum, you have the annual monocrops. So that's like the, the fields of corn and soybeans and cotton. And, and then on the other side of that is the perennial polycultures. And that's basically nature. Because mm -hmm. annual monocrops, they live one year and there's a bunch of them in one place, all the mm -hmm. same. And then with the perennial polyculture, it's a bunch of different plants. Biodiversity is very high. Mm -hmm. And then these plants live a very long time. And so then when we're trying to grow food, we're gonna look at that natural model and then the, 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 the more we go with that model, the less we have to fight. Mm -hmm. You know, because when you're trying to go further away from nature, you have to fight her to keep that system going. And that's the kind of system we've kind of fallen into by industry, it's, big industry, right? I mean, it's very profitable because they have to use big machines. And, and the thing is now, I feel like it's changing because the price of the fossil fuels have risen so much that it's just not going to make any sense to keep growing food that way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've built this entire culture and the entire world it has been living off of these kinds of foods from the annual monocrop. So we'll see. I mean, I really hope that people get the transition going as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're planting the trees and the, and the berries and the vines, it takes a little more time. But once it's established, you're basically just harvesting. Right. And then your harvesting levels, your, your food is coming from different levels. Like you have down here, you have maybe your basil or your blueberries, and then you go up a little higher, you have apple trees, and then even higher, you have maybe avocado trees. And mm -hmm. it's really a cool three-dimensional way to grow food. Right. And so you've been doing this for how long now? I've been really passionate about it for about six years. Mm -hmm. And then in the spring of 2008, I planted my first one in Minnesota. And I wanted to plant it in Minnesota where my parents live. So in case things get kind of hairy in the next few decades, they're going to have a nice food source right across. It's almost like the grocery stores right across the road. Nice. And then they can just <laughs> boom, pick it. It's just a matter of picking it. You know, we've got mm -hmm. all the raspberries coming and gooseberries are coming. And, and it's just like, it's really for the convenience and the health, knowing that it's not sprayed, knowing who picked it and who grew it with love. It's really like mm -hmm. a cool way to do this. And... I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm really feeling like it's the answer, you know, mm -hmm. to all of our problems. Because once a family were to start doing these kinds of methods, they're eating clean food, they're reconnecting with nature, you know, they're, they all of a sudden have a heart to make, you know, make the world a better place. And it's really like you're replanting paradise mm -hmm. in your own backyard. And in a way, you can almost look at the Garden of Eden as a, as a model that was given to us. And it just blows my mind that more people haven't tried to copy that yet. Right. Instead of just feeling like, oh, we got kicked out and, you know, Adam and Eve got kicked out and we're screwed and now we're living in this, you know, whatever, <laughs> not the best paradise possible. Instead, I'd say, let's just replant it and get on with it and just live, live in that world. And, and more than physically replanting it, but replanting it in our hearts too. Right. Knowing that we're angels here on the planet or, or you know, angels is such a loaded word, but just, you know, Spirit. enlightened souls, spirits right. to help, you know, each other evolve right. to the next level. But you did it not just for your parents, but you did it because it's really a project for, for, for the globe, basically, because you want to teach people how to uh, yeah. do the same thing, right? Yeah. It's really, and you've already done that. I have, yeah. I give talks. Uh, I was in Venice uh, at the Venice Community Garden two weeks ago, and I gave a good two-hour-long talk about the need for urban food forests right. and getting people into it in the cities. A lot of people think that they've got to move out into the boondocks and you know start their farm and all the hard work that goes along with that. But really, people aren't leaving cities anytime soon. Unless mm -hmm. things get really wacky, everyone's still going to be in the cities. So yes. we need to start planting the trees and the bushes there mm -hmm. and then you know we can just have this paradise garden yeah. with skyscrapers coming out through it I yeah i know that. i've seen some uh photographs of prototypes of urban food forests yeah and i know for sure that uh in detroit because there's been such urban blight there uh they've started taking these big homes and converting them into uh big farms and yeah. Uh, and it's all about uh, hydroponics uh -huh. and organics, which is, I think, incredible for an urban setting, right? Yeah. It's funny. It's almost like the um, 
what did they say? Ne uh, necessity is the mother in, of invention. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like that's what was happening there. I mean, people were really on the down and outs. There's all this degraded land which is open and people are now converting it. And and the same thing was with me. I was I was really scared about the peak oil stuff and you know global warming and all whatever. And it scared me to the point of, oh, I gotta plant this food forest. I gotta get this planted fast. And my whole goal was to have it totally planted by the age of 30. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I reached it. I mean, you can always plant a few more things, but everything's pretty well planted. And then I started another one in the desert of Phoenix, Arizona. Right. And that's more of a desert food forest. You know, mesquite tree canopies, citrus underneath, a lot of like blackberries, and we've got chickens there. So it's kind of cool to show there's the model in Minnesota, and then there's like a desert model in the... In I the think that's excellent work that you've done. I wanted to know what's your typical day like when you've, you've been in Minnesota uh, this summer already. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to ask you a question. Constance mm -hmm. in the chat room is asking, how do we participate in this form of living consciously if we live and work in the city where this sure. level of private, sustainable planting isn't possible? Absolutely. I, I was growing wheatgrass in my apartment for a very long time, doing sprouts. If you have a window with a southern facing exposure, if you're in the northern hemisphere, or vice versa if you're in the south, um, you can grow fruit trees in your window or berry bushes, a lot of herbs, you can do the hydroponic setups. Mm -hmm. And now I've, I've really realized, if you want to take part in this and you're living in the city and you can't fully do it, support those that are. That's so right. support the organic farmers, support the biodynamic people, people that are harvesting stuff from food forests, you know, people selling chocolate. Chocolate is like an integral part of a food forest where it likes to grow in the shade. Oh, really? And so people are growing it in the shade of Brazil nut trees, and, and that way you never have to deforest anything. Nice. And you're still pulling food, and it's supporting, the, it's supporting the indigenous people of those areas. And that's really like the key, is to mm -hmm. support those that are until you're ready to do it yourself. Yeah. Well, I know for me, it's like I'm growing, I have a pepper plant, and I've got the sapote, which yeah. I think you had planted a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> and I've got another tree that you I adopted from you, which that's, the that's a long tree. story, which I haven't told you. That one <laughs> lost all its leaves. I thought it was dead, but yeah. I, f I gave it lots of positive energy. It I was like, back. this one cannot go. <laughs> and it's still there, thank God. Uh, but what's your, like, you know, obviously we have a balcony so we can do that. But mm -hmm. for people that don't have a balcony in an urban setting, would, what, would those... I mean, Would that up still apply? Oh, absolutely. And you, you could always look into the community gardens mm -hmm. and you could look into guerrilla gardening as well, where, you know, maybe you go to an abandoned a parking lot and you start sprinkling dandelion seeds around. Guerrilla gardening. Guerrilla gardening. Mm -hmm. And that way it's almost like your, your garden has expanded to your neighborhood. It's not just your little backyard plot. It's really your entire area, your entire living space. I mean, there's a lot of... A lot of seeds that grow really well without human intervention. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, some of the stuff that we're used to, like maybe tomatoes and, and peppers, they need a little more coddling, a little more care. Yes. Lettuce is a good example. Like the slugs will just eat up the lettuce. But there's other stuff like nettles, burdock, dandelion that just grow really well. Mm -hmm. You know, the medicinal content is so high, like the leaves are really bitter, yeah. that the pests can only eat so much of it. And they can yeah. them. So gorilla gardens are really Yeah, good. well, because I know that like in where I live, I think that the windows, I have big windows, but I think they must have some kind of film on them because I can't seem to get my orchids to like flower. Yeah. They seem to only flower when I take them out and things yeah. like that. So I think that these are things that I'm just becoming aware of, but uh, the obstacles obviously that, yeah. we, that we have to face yeah. in doing this. But what's your typical day like in, a, in your Minnesota? I know that you got it. I saw a picture in your blog with a teepee. So yes. tell us what from the start to the end of the day. I recently purchased the teepee because I wanted just a, um, a temporary living space that could be taken down and moved somewhere else and it didn't increase the property taxes, which I thought was really cool. <laughs> and then it's just kind of appealing where people would like it. I'll wake up, you know, it depends when I go to sleep. I, it, when I'm in Minnesota, I usually try and go to sleep around 10 or 11 and then I sleep in the teepee there. Wake up, kind of, I'll usually, you know, check it out, walk around the garden for a little bit, see if anything needs some work, do some stretches. I like to lay out in the sun on the, on the sun deck that we built and do some stretches, even laying out there naked to get like a lot of the sun like all over your body. I think mm -hmm. that's a really important thing where there's certain parts of our body that never see the sun. Right. And it's strange, strange enough, a lot of those parts get cancer. Mm -hmm. So trying to let the sun heal those parts. 
and then you know maybe make breakfast around three hours later you know around uh, 11 o'clock and how are you making your breakfast breakfast recently has been a lot of smoothies but it's been more animal based so i'm doing raw eggs milk grass-fed milk and really the quality is important where you want to buy you know buy these products from people that really care you can, um, eggs are really awesome because you can always tell the quality based on the yolk. If mm -hmm. it's a really nice dark yes. yellow orange yolk, the, the birds are eating really good food. And if it's kind of a pale yellow, they're just eating grains. You know, mm -hmm. So you're basically getting concentrated grains right. instead of concentrated greens and bugs and mm -hmm. you know, whatever else they're eating. So I'll make a smoothie and maybe throw some berries in, maybe some um, vanilla protein powder. Um, I'm a real big fan of Sun Warrior. They've got some awesome protein powder. And then, you know, uh, kind of go on. Maybe I'll work out a little bit. I like to do uh, the P90X style that we were doing for, I mean, that was awesome. I use those same exercises, but I kind of do them sporadically throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm at home, maybe watching something on Netflix, or I'll just kind of do this, you know, and just do some stomach crunches, or I'll, mm -hmm. or I'll do the, you know, do the barbells, and, and just kind of multitask within that within that pair. It makes it easier to, to keep the exercises up if I'm kind of distracting myself with either a podcast or you know interviews, of course, and mm -hmm. then videos. Yeah, it kind of makes right. it a little more enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, I know the people in the chat rooms and from, you were in, in one of the other shows a couple of weeks ago, they were talking about your abs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they must have seen it somewhere. They were saying, we want to see Anthony's abs. <laughs> uh, so does that conclude your, your day? Or like well, the day is kind of random. It, it, if, if I'm in Minnesota, it's just kind of like what needs to be done. So around most of the, the forest. Around, yeah, around the, the food forest. Right. And that might be pulling some weeds. I mean, this food forest is in its fourth year now, so it's getting close to self-preservation, but it still needs a little help with pulling weeds from around the trees and, and just seeing if anything needs harvesting. You know, maybe I'll, my, my dad's a woodworker, so I go down to his shop and I help him out if he needs some stuff. It's kind of a, almost like a semi-retired lifestyle up there because all my needs have been taken care of. You know, nice. I don't have rent because I live in a teepee. I have, I have, uh, I, it was a lot of upfront expenses, you know, like I had yes, to have, I, the, remember. I had to have the well drilled and that was like $7,000, but now my water is free, you know, and, and my bills are just very low. My electric bill might be $30 a month because it's just to pump the water and maybe run my laptop. And, and so it's, it's kind of just like I do what I want to do. You know, I'm studying French right now and, uh, <laughs> you know, listening to podcasts, stretching. It's just kind of a very random, random day. But I'm always mixing in self-improvement throughout the day. But you didn't mention any real work. <laughs> I know. Well, that's the thing. It's like maybe there's one day where I have to go somewhere and get a load of compost or manure. And then I'll be, you know, shoveling and with the buckets. And, and right. that's super intense. But that might be one day out of 30. And the rest is just kind of casual weeding, you know, like I'll have some seedlings and I'll put them in and, you know, it's, it's, it's very casual, much but more. But it does require hands-on, I mean, Absolutely. obviously. So you need the time to be able to create this great forest. Yeah. And that's one thing that we're always lacking over here. That's, yeah, so that's a key. There has to be a way that we can combine that with the city living, mm -hmm. like you were saying, and and make it, you know, worth our while. Oh, sure. Somebody's asking here, Rosemary Vargas, what is the lowest maintenance, easiest, nutritious food to plant? The lowest maintenance? I would probably say dandelion. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Those yeah. are fast and easy, huh? Yeah, I mean, because you get the whole thing is edible. You can eat the flowers, yes. you can eat leaves, roots. And then it's just like, wow, they, they get so big if you leave them alone for a while. I mean, their leaves, when you see ba young dandelions, maybe the leaves are that big. But if you let them go a few years, leaves are that big, you know, so. Yeah, I know. I, uh, I love dandelions, but they make, they make you go to the bathroom a lot. Yeah, it is a kind of a diuretic. I yeah. like to mix them into my other salads because they are quite bitter, especially the ones that are growing. There's varieties that are a little more domesticated, but... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you just mix in the wild ones or do a little juice. Nettles are another one too. All those like, uh, they're called right. dynamic accumulators where they, they, the roots really go down and they pull up a lot of stuff that's a little further down. And burdock is another good example of that too. And you can do, is it possible to do those indoors you think? Or? Oh, absolutely. Oh, really? As long as you've got enough sun. Uh, yeah, really. And like how many hours would you say of sun? 
four or five. Oh, that's, I can do that at home then. And especially with these greens, because the greens really just, uh, they don't need as much juice to produce the fruit. If you're seeing tomatoes and peppers, they need a lot of juju to get it going. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the greens, they're just making greens. You know, Great. they're not trying to make fruit. So it's a little bit easier. That's awesome. Somebody yeah. wants to know what podcast do you listen to? Oh, I'm a, I'm a big fan and we're all tied in with this is one radio network, Patrick yes. Timpone. Uh, that stuff changed my life because yes. he's pulling from all over the place, not just maybe a raw vegan paradigm, but he's pulling from primal, this and that, um, life improvement, um, financial stuff with Andy Goss. I mean, just really life-changing information. Which, you know, he's coming to only mm -hmm. one TV. I do. Yeah. I do. They're both coming, right? It's awesome. Yeah. And that, that's a good one. And then I'll listen to, you know, um, the Coffee Break French that I've been listening to. For it's, your French lessons. Yeah, that's on <laughs> iTunes, you know, and... Uh, I'll just even put some stuff on YouTube and just, you know, listen to the audio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. And uh, how about, they want, Rosemary wants to know, do you have an outhouse composting toilet in Minnesota with your TP lifestyle? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no compost of yet, but I definitely go outside. So mm -hmm. I kind of have an area that's accumulating my compost right and human Which is fertilizer it's humanure yeah humanure is that's the thing and humanure they call it and i i eat a clean diet so i'm not scared of it mm. and um i just kind of go back behind behind my deck over there where it's kind of quiet and people don't walk by and right and then it's just kind of it's accumulating underneath a hardy kiwi of all things so mm -hmm. if anyone's buying hardy kiwis from me in the next few years <laughs> <laughs> They'll be uh, blessed in more ways than one, <laughs> for sure. Uh, how about Anthony Miguel wants to know, can hey. you speak about chemtrails? By the way, guys, oh, you yeah. know, we're talking about a lot of different subjects, and the whole idea behind this show is that it's a talk show, as you can see. But, uh, and Anthony's going to be the host, not me. I know I'm asking a lot of questions, but it's just to kind of get, uh, get you guys to uh, get a feel for Anthony. Uh, but we're going to have uh, uh, speakers and guests, oh, yeah. uh, whether they're live or on Skype here on the monitor, uh, and experts in all these topics, mm -hmm. because we want to hear what they have to say as well mm -hmm. and learn from them. And uh, so, yeah, Miguel wants to know about chemtrails. Uh, chemtrails. Yeah, the chemtrails. I kind of tuned into chemtrails about two years ago. And then um, should we go to, do you want to go to break? Or no, no, go okay. ahead. It's, it's the big fat white lines in the sky that just kind of dissipate and they haze out the whole sky. And um, a friend of mine mentioned this, actually David Wolf was the mm -hmm. first one to mention chemtrails. I was like, what the heck, chemtrails, you know? It's almost like you don't notice it until you actually look up. We're so busy with our day-to-day -day life. Right. And I just started noticing the big fat white lines and then other planes wouldn't leave them, but the other planes would, and they're at the same altitude. It wasn't like a magic number, it seemed. And then they're just hazing out the, the beautiful blue sky. So I was right. like, what's going on here? And then I saw the, the movie, What in the World Are They Spraying? And they're talking about like the aluminum and the barium in there. And then how, you know, they're trying to uh, maybe geoengineering, like trying to block the sunshine out mm -hmm. or even trying, sometimes I think they're trying to reduce the vitamin D in everybody, mm -hmm. you know, really shading everyone out so our immune systems go. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be sinister. It might be, it might be all in our heads, but it's something that I never noticed as a kid. I never noticed the big fat white lines. And usually if it's a contrail, it'll disappear after right. about 10 seconds, you know, following the plane. Mm -hmm. But these just stay and then they spread. Right. And whether or not there's chemicals in them, it's, it's ruining a beautiful blue day, blue mm -hmm. sunny day, and there's mm -hmm. nothing cool about that. Yeah. So I, I don't just, know much about it, but, uh, yeah. I, you know, who knows? I, everyone's so uh, skeptical about those oh, yeah. kind of things. So yeah. it's hard to really get an authoritative uh, figure to give mm -hmm. you a definitive answer on that. Oh yeah, there's so many things. You can see a lot of stuff on YouTube where some weathermen uh, that used to be in the Marines, they would say, oh yeah, they're, they're gonna lie to, about this, but it's actually chemtrails and blah, blah, blah. What was the name of the movie you what, said? What in the world are they spraying? And where do you find that? It's on YouTube for free, but oh, you can buy oh. the DVD too. Great. Yep. And uh, there's another, Oh, there's a website called weathermodification.com and it's a, it's a commercial business that actually tries to modify the weather by injecting, they say, silver iodide into oh, the clouds. Oh, I've heard of this, yeah. So when, the, when people are in the government are saying, oh, we can't do this yet, we can't do this, oh, they, they're already doing it. Yes. And I think they were, they were doing it in Vietnam. I mean, they were forcing rain to come down and just rain out 
the mm. North Vietnamese, mm. so they couldn't. And this is well known. Mm. But then they're still saying that they can't do it yet. Right. A lot of weird double double speak. Mm. And I know someone in um, in Phoenix who made friends with a weather person, a meteorologist there, and he told her after a few drinks that the the government took them to Luke Air Force Base and showed them the whole operation, but told them like you can't talk about this. Like probably made him sign non disclosures. Yeah. yeah. So all the weathermen, I, that's the one thing I always wondered. Like the weathermen, they see you know the the day to day stuff, and they never talk about the sky being hazed out mm -hmm. by planes. Mm -hmm. How bizarre is that? And right. they never bring it up that's the no. weirdest thing because if you were to look at you know how they do that fast speed throughout the day you know like the clouds rolling in if you were to watch one of those like pew, 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 and then it's hazy right you know but does it uh, concentrate around urban cities or rural or both it or? seems like it would be flight paths you know like in Minnesota there's a flight path and we see them once in a while but not that much anymore but it's always in the urban centers right yeah, because I'm reading here, uh, Brenda's saying she lives in Los Angeles. Uh, she's been living there for 20 years, and she's noticed them for the past five years. It's gotten really bad. She yeah, says. yeah. And, and I know here, since you brought that up a few years you, back, you I, I notice them all the time. It's yeah. pretty wacky. Uh, well, I was in California the, the about two weeks ago, and it was actually really good, you know, and I lived in LA for about six months last year, and some days it's just horrible, and then other days it's beautiful. You know, so I'm just wondering, what's mm -hmm. the variation? Is it humidity, or are there just days that they spray? You know, and they yeah. call them spray days. I just think, I can't help to think that it's some kind of, uh, like, uh, pharmaceutical to subdue hu the human race in a way, so we don't, you know, yeah. speak out and stand sure. out. You know, sure. I, I'm, I don't well, know. Well, lithium would be a good one for that, and there are even some people are suggesting that they put lithium in the water now to mm -hmm. get people to be in a better mood. And maybe it'll reduce suicide rates and all that. Really? You know, come on, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, fluoride's crazy enough. But. Yeah. And yeah, speaking of water, I mean, mm -hmm. I, this year, I think at the beginning of the year, I watched that uh, Blue Gold. Oh, yeah. That's a great documentary a great, on yeah. water. Blue Gold, yes. Um, and these are, you know, again, some of the, these great topics that Anthony, yeah, we'll cover you know, in depth. wants to cover. And uh, mm -hmm. we're going to bring some people in here to really question these these ideas and thoughts absolutely uh let's take a, a minute to go to our sponsors and um and we would like you know for our our listeners and and watchers to um patronize them of course if you're in um in you know new york city go uh to mezzi grill because they have a uh, authentic mediterranean food with a very unique style and flavor and um, they are on 8th Avenue and 55th Street, uh, just south of uh, Columbus Circle. And um, most recently, they've been on Al Jazeera. They've been all over the press because they actually accept Bitcoins now. Mm -hmm. And so they've gotten a huge press around that. And, uh, and we're very grateful for their sponsorship and yeah. for them to sponsor your show as well. Yeah. And uh, usgoldcoins.com is our other sponsor. And uh, if you want to buy uh, silver and gold numismatic coins, they are the trusted source. Uh, we actually have done business with them in the past, and they take a, a very personal approach, uh, especially uh, because if you don't know anything about silver and gold, they kind of take the mystery out of it, and they mm -hmm. sell you graded coins. So that kind of takes away the, the whole idea that it could be fake or that it's not worth what they're claiming because you can actually see that it's graded and it, and it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're great. Um, uh, we uh, like to ask people to call them if you're interested because they do have a personal approach and they're a lot easy, easier to get in a hold of through the phone as opposed to their website, which has some things that they sell on their website, but uh, primarily you can get the list from them directly. Mm -hmm. uh, our other sponsor, is uh, Carpe VM and they are uh, video marketing and they uh, basically they um, market uh, your brand and your business and they create videos around whatever you know uh, you're trying to promote or sell and they're also in New York but they do business uh, all over and you can uh, contact them through uh, contact Charlie at carpevm.com and they also are great people too they you know they're they've they've been sponsoring our show since the very beginning and uh in our network so 
we just love them and we want you to hopefully uh, use them and uh, call them and, and do business with them. And also um, uh, TradeHill.com, the Bitcoin exchangers, there are the new guys and uh, we have a, a referral code for 10% off of your lifetime doing business with them and it's on the screen th-r141 and it's tradehill.com and also uh, mountgox.com is our uh, last sponsor and they are the bitcoin exchangers as well and if you want to buy bitcoins or get your bitcoins out and get dollars euros uh, they now uh, uh, exchange australian and like some other currency, mm. but they have all new things coming out and uh, they're um, very innovative as far as uh, what they're doing in, in the Bitcoin world. And um, we want to thank our sponsors and hopefully you guys will thank them for us and patronize them as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, let's see what else. Uh, people in the chat room, what kind of questions you have for Anthony? I think... Uh, uh, that's being done without water. Oh, yeah, Miguel was mentioning something about the water. Uh, and Brenda says, Rosemary, I used to watch you on the work outside years ago. Something about Australia. And I saw. Oh, yeah, yeah. She was on Australia for a while. What? Yeah. Doing what? Uh, I think she was doing uh, some garden stuff and or maybe hanging out. I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe Woof. That's a really cool program that we'll have to talk about. Willing, uh, it's um, worldwide... Worldwide uh, opportunities on organic farms. I think that's on organic farms. I think that's and it. it's about uh, it's permaculture. A, yeah, it, it's a, a permaculture, and it's just about it gives young people or young and old alike a good a good chance to live in another country and then help out at an, at an organic farm, and then in mm. exchange for thirty hours a week, room and boards provided. And mm. I've I've done that myself, where I had a, a friend come and stay for ten days, and then mm. I just you know paid for groceries, and we you know whatever and and you basically he, taught him how to yeah. what you were doing yeah yeah he came around and followed me so around like an apprentice mm -hmm. kind of uh, situation yeah a little slave labor too but yeah <laughs> well kidding. hey well yeah you gotta learn somehow that's the thing and that's really where the lessons are is like oh gosh you really have to put in the time and shovel horse poop for four hours you know and, <laughs> and those kind of things it's like a lesson but it's a lesson in hard work too yeah well, well from what better teacher than than you of yeah, course well we try we try i mean that, that's a really good chance for young people to get out yeah. and like if someone feels i have a friend that's actually kind of suicidal right now and you know just feeling like everything's in a dead end and nowhere to go and and I said, why don't you just move to Hawaii and, and work, on a, work on an organic farm for four months or a month, you know, and just get your life back together. You know, yeah. you don't have to stay in Minnesota. So, the, like, programs like that really give people a good opportunity to kind of branch out. And yeah, I mean, absolutely. you could do it in another country and learn the language, learn about organic gardening, live for free, you know. It would just be a really good opportunity for young people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, they want to know, are you back on meat? Are you still vegan or still raw or good what's question. your status? I, so I was a raw vegan for uh, 2004 to 2009, pretty much. And then I started branching out. I started listening to some of this One Radio Network. I started hearing more about the Weston Price lifestyle. Yeah, it's excellent. Weston Price was a dentist back in the 1920s and 30s. And he started seeing all the, all the folks coming in with messed up teeth. Because what was happening was the, the diet was becoming more processed, more refined, less minerals. And he figured, you know, he's like, gosh, if, if you know, God or, or, the, or the Creator wanted us to be perfect, you know, we, we would be perfect. Obviously, we're doing something wrong here. So he took his wife, took his poor wife around the world for 10 years, and they just photographed all these indigenous tribes that hadn't been touched yet by Western foods. Mm -hmm. And what was really cool was wherever there was a, a group of people that was isolated, somewhere nearby, there would be another group of the same ethnic background that had accepted these foods. And he took photos, measured all the cavities and everything, and the, the contrast was stark where you know, people that were living up in the hills, eating their natural diet without toothbrushes, were having maybe one cavity in their entire life mm -hmm. because there was so little sugar in the diet and everything was so mineralized. And then they would go down to the, to the harbor, maybe 20 miles away where people were doing this, mm -hmm. and oh my gosh, just, Different. A, just a casino in their mouth, just messy, 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 mm -hmm. you know, cavities like crazy, deformed jaws. Like not only was it bad cavities, but like their faces were becoming deformed and their, their, their the chins were pointing. And their, their yeah. jaw bones might... Yeah. yeah. 
all yeah, the I've all studied a lot about Western Price. I think it's an incredible uh, resource for anything, for information, mm -hmm. for lifestyle, you know, whatever. Uh, but uh, if you go to, the, I think, if, and their website, it's it should be pretty. Easy. There's a lot of stuff on there. It's pretty technical. Uh, but if you want to even start down this road, it's a great place to start, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a good book on that based... Um, based. She's the... Uh, Sally Fallon is the, uh, the president, I believe, of the foundation. Mm -hmm. Nourishing Traditions. And it's a cookbook, but it's also kind of a diet book. And talking about all these things and what she went through. And, and I feel like that might be a little grain heavy. I'm trying to get more into a primal diet where I'm looking at my ancestors and seeing what did they eat maybe a thousand years ago. And what they were eating was fish. You know, okay, I'm from Ireland, my ancestors are from Ireland and Sweden. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing a lot of fish, you're seeing a lot of raw dairy, and you know, dairy from cows that were eating grass, not mm -hmm. corn and grains. I mean, that's a big difference, because the omega-3 profile is way lower when they're eating grains. Mm -hmm. But if they're eating grass, it's, it's much higher. Right. So now I'm just saying, Look at what they were eating, you know, and it always kind of ties back into low sugar. It ties into very high mineral foods and it's no one was ever vegan. Like he even went to Hawaii and like the Polynesian islands mm. looking for a vegan society and they always would eat animal products. Mm -hmm. And I try, I mean, I, I would do like a low fat vegan experiment and my, my sex drive totally went away because my cholesterol went down so low. Which isn't a good thing, you yeah. know. I think that's a big myth. That we all need cholesterol we to do. synthesize we uh, do proteins i guess or yeah and for the brain and like uh, healthy hormone function you know cholesterol is like the foundation of that so when people start trying to strip out their cholesterol i mean it's just bad for the brain it's bad for the body bad for the sex drive i mean yeah. no one's happy so which contradicts conventional yeah well there's wisdom. a lot of money to get cholesterol down a lot of money lipitor and whatever else oh i mean it's God. big business so and that uh, you know i've seen some before and after pictures they almost of people taking these Lipitor, mm -hmm. and it almost seems like the before and after pictures that you would see of a crystal meth, meth. addict. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, they aged 20 years in like two years. Yeah. No, it's crazy. And it's the Lipitor that's doing is toxic I would think on so. your liver, I would think. I would think so. I mean, yeah. the results speak for itself. Yeah. Um, and then, so as far as my diet, I have included animal products back in fully where I started with maybe like a little uh, goat yogurt and maybe some eggs and then I now then I started getting just like some organs like where I would eat liver like bison liver yeah. and then maybe some ground ground bison and maybe some you know if the chickens are eating the right thing or maybe quail or something so it's more much more of a primal diet and I always thought coming out of the vegan world that it wasn't going to digest and it was going to go putrid in my intestines and I was going to get gonna acne. sit there for yeah five days all these problems right. no problems at all no because if your bowels are working fine then that shouldn't happen right right well the key is to have enough hydrochloric acid in the belly where if you're a vegan for such a long time, you've alkalized your whole digestive tract where it can't break down those foods anymore. Right. So people are dependent on enzymes and probiotics and mm -hmm. it's almost like a junkie, like always having to buy probiotics and enzymes instead of just eating foods like yogurt and you know fermented vegetables or whatever. So I'm really trying to get back to the way it was mm -hmm. and realizing that we're living in just a little blip on the screen where it was like natural food, natural food, natural food, boom, a little, a little blip of all these funky factory foods. And pretty soon we're going to go, we're going to get back to it, mm -hmm. whether it's by choice or by no other choice. And I, I really think that might happen pretty soon where mm -hmm. it's going to cost too much to make all these junky foods mm -hmm. and, you know, to pay everybody to make them. So we're just going to have to go back to organic food and organic animal products and fishing for ourselves again. Yeah. I remember your dad was a fisherman. And yeah, I know. I really admire what he taught me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I ate a lot of sardines. I was, I was thinking the other day, just trivial, but uh, some of the things that I got from that was it taught me patience. It taught me um, to, um, what was the other thing? It was patience and I forget the other thing right now, but it was, uh, it was pretty significant because I watched this movie recently about that. Someone was teaching someone how to fish mm -hmm. and you can gain a lot from just, you know, from the actual doing part as a, you know, in addition to the receiving part. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of good life lessons. So you're, uh, so you went from... A regular Minnesota corn-fed diet, probably. Yeah, you know. To vegan. Right. To raw. To raw. So it was more like vegetarian, where I started cutting out the meat. 
just the flesh, you know, and thinking I could still do the eggs and the, and the dairy. But I, I didn't make the connection yet with the quality. I didn't know that there were good eggs and there were bad eggs. And there's good milk and bad milk. Right. And that was the whole thing. When I was growing up, I had a lot of acne. Um, you know, I had to have braces. My teeth were all messed up. My jaw was thin. I had my jaw spread out when they were doing the braces. And, you know, just, yeah, the acne was crazy. So what I realized is my omega-6s were just through the roof. Mm -hmm. I was eating a very high omega-6 diet instead of right. a high omega-3 diet. Right. So now when I tell people whether or not you're vegan or raw, just look for omega-3 foods and then just get those in. But I'll tell you what, the animal foods that are high in omega-3 are much better for you than the plant foods. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can just convert it more. You're going to get all the, the good stuff out of it. And, and why? Just because we've assimilated to it that's over the, thing. the thousands of years, right? Yeah. I mean, based on someone's idea of creation, uh, it's been a long, long, long time. <laughs> Million, I'd say millions and millions of years since right. we've been... I mean, maybe we came out of the trees. This is all conventional evolutionary theory, but we came out of the trees maybe five million years ago. And even then, we were eating small fruits and nuts and insects. Berries. Yeah. And now, okay, so then we're on the ground. Now we're starting to eat large mammals. And we can't fight that. You know, we can't fight what our ancestors did because they built us. All of those habits have led to this massive brain That's right. that needs a lot of fat and, you know, all, you know, everything, everything. So we're kind of a product of that. And if we try and stand back and think, oh, we can, we can evolve and we can do a, a totally different paradigm. It's, it's right. a whole, the vegan diet is a very new experiment. Mm -hmm. And there's no cultures that ever did it. Even yeah. like the, the Indians, like Hindu. Uh, they were still doing milk and they might have been doing eggs, but for sure they were doing milk and ghee because they knew that if you were going to have healthy babies for years, you know, generations and generations, you needed that nutrition. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of vegans now and I see a lot of young vegan kids and it's not something that I would want to do. Mm -hmm. And I think just look at the results, look at who's telling you these things and see who's doing it long term. And so far, I really haven't seen much that I would want to copy. And so what, what do you think shifted within you to, like, change to the Initially. Different? Yeah, like, was it just educating yourself more or... Yeah. And also probably the way you felt. Probably, that, yeah, yeah that, came, that came a little bit later, especially with the raw, that came later. But at first, it was just kind of getting into the environment and then seeing all these factory farm videos. And they just scare the heck out of you, you know, like the PETA videos. And, and the only option they give you is veganism. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like, okay, find people that raise their animals properly and feed them properly and love them. Mm -hmm. You know, like we've got the chickens in Arizona and they all have names. You know, and we feed yeah. them. We and feed, you love them. Yeah, we pet them and we feed them good food and they give us eggs. You know, like what is so bad about that? It's mm -hmm. not, they're not in cages and, you know, eating GMOs and... So that was a big difference for me. And then I went from the vegetarian to then the more hardcore vegan. And then when I went, well, when I was the vegan, I was still doing a lot of grains, a lot of cooked grains, like couscous and rice. And, and I just didn't feel vibrant, you know, it wasn't anything different. So then I went to the raw vegan by cutting out all those grains. And since it was a low fat raw vegan diet, I felt very alert. I was working out like two hours a day. I had a lot of oxygen in my body. But then again, it was kind of unstable and I had these crazy cravings for like junk food. Sugar. <laughs> sugar. Yeah, mm -hmm. just crazy sugar cravings. And living in New York City, everything's accessible mm -hmm. 24 hours a day. So I could just walk down to the nearest bodega <laughs> and buy a pint of Ben and Jerry's, you know, and eat it. And it actually led me to bulimia for about a year mm -hmm. because I, I knew that these, I was supposed to be eating this food, but I was still craving this food. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I thought it was going to make me puffy and I wasn't going to work. So it drove me to bulimia for like a solid year. Mm -hmm. On and off. Were you closeted about that at the yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I didn't want to tell people because I, I wanted them to think that raw vegan was the best possible diet. Right. But raw vegan kind of drove me to this eating disorder. Yes. And I, I balanced... And you're a model too, so that probably has something to do with it. Yeah, that's, I think I wouldn't have been so extreme about it unless I was a model. Because I really felt like, okay, I have to make money. I got to be thin. And, mm -hmm. and now since I've switched and I've gone high fat animal based... The cravings are gone, you know, mm -hmm. the, it's easier to maintain my weight because there's not so much sugar in my body. Like I still eat raspberries and blueberries and maybe some mangoes. Fructose. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's so much lower. So I used to eat maybe uh, 10 apples a day, just kind of chomping, you know, I'd have a couple, <laughs> a big bag of raisins in my, in my backpack for later and just like a sugar, sugar, sugar. And then I had to really work out a lot 
to keep that weight off because right. my body just wanted to turn that sugar right into fat. fat yeah. So after switching to the high fat diet, it was just night and day, no cravings, kept thin. I basically have to just work out to keep the weight on and then it's perfect. Face stays lean, everything like that, yeah. That's great. Uh, Miguel wants to know what are our natural alternatives to Lipitor? Well, I don't even think you'd want to. You wouldn't even want to lower your cholesterol. I think mm -hmm. a good number is 200 to 220. And then just what happens is with cholesterol, and this is like we're talking about the buildup in the arteries. Mm -hmm. You have to think of that buildup as like the cable repairman who's coming to fix your cable. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is by people, with people eating all the refined starches and sugars, and that could be corn syrup, that could be, it could be anything, you know, any kind of refined food, it's irritating the whole body, it's inflaming the body, mm -hmm. and especially in the bloodstream. So the body sends cholesterol to that area to almost as like a band-aid mm -hmm. to soothe it and heal it. But people keep eating more of those inflaming foods. So the body keeps trying to lay down more and more cholesterol to mm -hmm. heal. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they clog them up and they die because mm -hmm. they, they never switch their diet. Mm -hmm. If they were to just switch their diet to a non-inflaming omega-3 diet, um, that the cholesterol would just start to break away because it doesn't need it there anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like that cholesterol is the cable repair man. And it's like we're blaming him for the cable going out when he's just showing up to fix it. Right. <laughs> so it's not like we even want to lower our cholesterol. Yeah. I think those numbers are all skewed by the pharmaceuticals trying to get them down lower. Yeah. I, I have, for the longest time, I always recommended uh, like steel cut oats. Sure. For that. And yeah. I think it's very beneficial. Lately, I've been hearing some things in, on Patrick Tempone. I forget this guy was talking about eating it during certain times because of the body chemistry, physiology, et cetera, mm -hmm. which makes some sense. But I know that that is very good at lowering cholesterol mm -hmm. overall. So, and it's helped me in the past. Um, but I, I, I'm not, the only thing I'm steadfast on with in my diet is like my eggs in the morning, pretty much. And then, um, you know, my greens, of course, but the greens. they vary totally every day. So all different types of greens. Um, Let's see. Uh, sardines are awesome and cheap. Yeah. Super cheap. Uh, my can, dad taught me. That was another thing my dad taught me. <laughs> sardines. They can, be, they can be real cheap. Like I've seen them at Walmart for $1.09 for a tin. And that's wild food from the North Atlantic. So wild, really? Sardines are always wild. Yep. Mm -hmm. And they're on the bottom of the food chain. And that's a really important thing to know because they haven't had time like tuna and swordfish and shark. To, they're not apex predators where they're eating everything below them. So the sardines, they just eat phytoplankton and like maybe some little, little things. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, that's all they really eat. So mm -hmm. by the time you're harvesting them, they haven't even had time to accumulate anything. Mm -hmm. And it's cheap and it's like loaded in omega-3s and it's maybe a dollar, a dollar fifty. There's yeah. some tins that are maybe four dollars, but really it's not like it's someone manufacturing it. It's a wild food that they're just putting in a tin. Right. So it's basically just a matter of marketing and packaging at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I, I learned to dislike them at an early age because my dad used to eat them all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I'm back into sardines again. Yeah. And I love the, the oil based ones. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. The olive oil ones. Yeah. <laughs> Look out for the, you know, the ones that are in mustard or in some other ones. Just check the back and make sure you don't see soybean oil. You don't see canola oil and maybe cottonseed oil because they'll oh, put okay. that stuff in. You want to go with the olive oil or the spring water. Nice. Yeah. And do you make kombucha? I do. What's your thoughts with the sugars? Well, the, the, the SCOBY, which is a symbiotic colony of yeast and ba bacteria and yeast, that's SCOBY, uh, they eat the sugar. Right. You know, so that's, that, that's their whole thing. And we're drinking the byproduct of that whole process. So there's really no sugar in it. And the longer you let it go, the, almost the more vinegary it becomes. Right. So when you start off with your sweet tea, and that's what the SCOBY eats. Well, you want to tell people what kombucha is in case they don't yep. know? Kombucha is a, uh, I believe it's a tea from, it's a, not a tea, but it's a, it's a fermented beverage. Right. Probably from Asia. And it's a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast that lives on caffeine. So caffeine from green or black tea and oh, really? sugar. Oh. They, that's, what, that's what it needs. And I don't know how it was developed over you know, millennia and all that, but it, uh, it's a great probiotic. It's nice to drink you know, with food because it'll help break other things down. It's yeah. loaded in I really love the effervescence of it. Yep, yep. And if you want the effervescence, if you're making it yourself, you need to put it in a bottle with just a little touch of sugar. 
and then that yeast will feed on it. Right. And then when and then you pop ready. it open, poof, yeah. bubbles. Nice. Yeah. And there's some nice ones that you can get it like in a champagne bottle now. They have kombucha. Yeah, I went to a raw um, potluck once and someone had made, yeah, the champagne. Yeah, the champagne. Oh, it's man, really good. It's really good. It's really good. And it shouldn't have to be too sweet. Some people like to pull their kombucha early where there's still a little sugar. Or they might add a little juice at the end. But it really, there's not much sugar in it. And the, so and the fermentation is happening from the sugar, not from sunlight, right? You no, know, it, it doesn't like sunlight. It's oh, just okay. from the temperature, at like Got 70 it. to 80 degrees. Because I know certain fermentations happen only through sunlight and... Oh uh, gosh, I don't know. Possibly, yeah. Because they always put them in these clear glass and stuff. That's usually just because it's in glass. But a lot of it you want to keep it in the dark. Because like the UV rays will damage them, actually. Mm -hmm. So you could do it in a dark glass. Like this right here is my water bottle and it's made out of Myron glass. Mm -hmm. Light can't get in. And actually when I go to the airport, um, they have to look inside because this is they can't see what's they in can't here. See it. <laughs> They're like, what the, you know? So they take it out and they look and they make sure it's empty, of so course. So it must be strong glass? It's a, just a really thick, dark blue glass, almost purple. What and is it called again? Myron. Oh, I Myron. believe it's M-I-R-O-N. Mm. And that really bl blocks out all the light, keeps it really pure. Mm -hmm. And that's that whole thing. And I know you're really into drinking water from springs. Yes, there's a great website. Have you continued doing that? I have, I have. and. Now I have my well in Minnesota, and that's kind of what I pull from in there. But otherwise, when I'm here, we'll always go to the springs. Findaspring.com is the best site for that. It's a, yeah, I'm so glad they created that. It's a nonprofit. It's just a, a resource on the web with all the maps, and you can read reviews and see what you like. And uh, since we're in New York, I either go to Cold Spring Harbor, which is on the north, north shore of Long Island, or we go out to... Um, Stokes State Forest in New Jersey. So any of you folks in New Jersey, you're in a really good spot for really awesome water that's totally free. So what we do is we'll just buy some, you know, you can buy the glass bottles or you can just use old milk jugs, whatever you, whatever you have on hand, and then just fill them all up, throw them in the back of your car, take them home, and we would do that once a month. Mm -hmm. You know, the best possible water you could ever want, straight out of Mother Earth. You know, it hasn't been on a shelf, it hasn't gone through weird pipes you know, with rusting and contaminants. And then it's like, boom, it's, it's yours, you know, and it's free. And I know that uh, the other thing you have to uh, pay attention to when you're doing that is the parts per million of... Yeah, the TDS, parts per million. Right. So usually you want to bring a... What is TDS? A, a total dissolved solids. Got it. Good yeah. question, yeah. That's right. And so some, like let's say you go out west or maybe where Patrick lives down in Texas, he's got a lot of limestone, a lot of calcium, mm -hmm. and they might be reading at 800. You know, so, or then we'll go up to... Which is good, right? Well, it's a mineral water. I mean, so there's a oh, lot Oh, that's of, right. The lower the number, the better. That's you right. You usually want it lower. I mean, that's those right. things can be kind of therapeutic and like with the sulfur and, and all that kind of stuff, but it will build up in your system. Mm -hmm. Like all those minerals will start to almost maybe calcify some of your joints and all that. So I don't try to drink too much of it. You want to go low, but you don't want to go distilled mm -hmm. because distilled processed water, it's stripped out. It doesn't have any memory. You mm -hmm. want to go for really low TDS spring water, anywhere from, you know, even 15 to 300. And on the website, it, does it have that? Usually yeah, it does. Usually it. people will list it. And I never really worry about contaminants because usually these are in forests like protected forests, and the Forest Service has to test it for E. coli. Mm -hmm. And remember, like these uh, underground aquifers, mm -hmm. which are underground lakes, they are maybe hundreds of feet below the ground. Mm -hmm. So all the water that has reached that is pre-industrial, usually. Like yeah, so I was going to say, how do you know that there's no chemical plant up the stream that's dumping? Yeah. Oh, well, you'll know at least through the TDS if it's not too high, but then also... Because the TDS, will, if there's a lot of... Yeah, if, then if there's increase. like bacteria or poop in there or something, it'll just shoot up like crazy. And then just realizing that it's been filtered through hundreds of feet of rock over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So actually the water that we're drinking from those springs have been, it's fossil water. It's been right. under, under the ground for maybe a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Way before people started doing funky stuff with industrial, agri I mean, all that kind of yeah. you know, industry. And the industrial revolution was 300 years ago. So... Um, a lot of these spots are still very pristine. That's really why I like the water, like the spring water. It's like fossil water. Yeah. None of this radiation nonsense. It's all super, super And it's super energized clean. by the earth. So there's magnetism and all kinds of things going on in there. I a think lot of love. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, and, and, and when you drink that stuff uh, for the first time, you'll notice that you have to pee a lot because your body is actually flushing out the old water that was in your system mm -hmm. and replacing it. Really, it becomes your blood, mm -hmm. and it's replacing it with that highly structured water straight out of the planet. Really cool. That's awesome. 
we have a few minutes left. Um, I think someone was asking about cocoa water or coconut what water. What do you think of cocoa water kefir? Oh, okay. Which is kind of like what we were talking about yeah, with the kombucha and the champagne yeah. and all that. They'll just ferment the coconut water. And no, it's a great probiotic and, you know, it's a, it's a good product. You can, you can ferment cooked coconut water, which is what you'll get in the cartons or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then just let that sit out at room temp for a couple days. And then you can just buy like a little kombucha starter or even just pour a little kombucha in it. Like the crystals, is that the same thing as the you, crystals? You could do that or you could just pour, pour the liquid because the mm -hmm. liquid is so full of the bacteria too. And then that'll just start eating all the sugars in the coconut water. Mm -hmm. And then with the coconut water, it can get a little sulfury, a little, little kind of funky, but right. it's a great product. <laughs> Smelling or tasting or both? More, t more smell mm -hmm. than the taste. Yeah. yeah. Just kind of eggy, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's a great product. I mean, geez. And what's the safest containers to hold water? I think you might have mentioned glass, that already. You know, glass carboy, or you know, I recommend getting one gallon, one gallon glass bottles, and you can usually get them for ten dollars, or you can even buy a gallon of apple juice at Whole Foods for eight dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, you can drink it or whatever you want to do, and then you've got your glass bottle, and then I'll, or even like they've got those square glass milk. Um, containers yes. and those stack really nice in like a plastic thing and mm. that way you're not lugging around a big one and maybe you slip on a piece of ice and boom you know yeah. you fall on. I know people uh, someone was asking Miguel agreed but what if I'm going to, to a spring and want to transport a large quantity and Brenda says use BPA free then I get home and transfer it into a glass yeah yeah and again even if you are doing it in the plastic <coughs> it's only been in the plastic for a little bit you know, it's not like it's been on the supermarket yeah. shelf for months and yeah. transport, you know, like you see at a, like a convenience store, the delivery guy will just put all the plastic, all the water bottles right on the, on the sidewalk, you know, right. as they're just kind of waiting to load stuff on up. On the sun. And the sun's just baking it, you know. That's and, what really stopped me from buying bottled water is yeah. too you many times know. seeing trucks on the side of the road and the sun is just baking all that water. Plastic tea. Plastic yeah. tea. Uh, then, That's uh, a huge one. One other question we have time for from O.C. Isabel. How can you prevent sagging skin when losing weight? Well, uh, Philip McCluskey... You have some experience, or yeah. somewhat experience, and you know Philip, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he lost. He went from 400 to 200, or maybe he's even 180 now, who knows? And I think it's kind of a, you know, there's MSM, foods like that. That's what Brenda said, yeah, you MSM know, powder. Lots of that. I mean, really even two tablespoons, three tablespoons a day. Um, putting oil on the body kind like of consistently. What kind of oil? Olive oil, coconut oil, you know, um, anything that's really not refined, even cacao butter or shea butter. Yeah, I use that. And it's, I think sometimes maybe people lose the weight too fast or they're, they're, they're doing it in such a way that it's not promoting healthy skin. Like they're just stripping out their calories mm -hmm. and they're just working out like crazy, work crazy. Instead of like a smoother transition with healthy foods loaded in omega-3s that are going to support the elasticity, like the elastin, which mm -hmm. is just a protein. Right. So it's just about getting the right foods in instead of just, I'm going to burn calories. Eh. And then people have, you know, they got to have surgery and all that. And mm -hmm. so really by doing it naturally with natural foods, high in omega-3s, and then just, you know, working out, of course, but keeping the muscle tone up. And then I think the transition would be much smoother and you wouldn't have to have saggy skin. And dry brushing, someone's sure. rosemary's recommending. That's awesome yeah. no matter what. Yeah, yeah, just good brushing before a sauna or before the shower, get everything moving, really helps the circulation. That's great, well, yeah. that's awesome. So we would like uh, for, for those of you watching to give us recommendations, give yeah, Anthony some email. recommendations as to who you would like to see on the show. Yeah and what topics you would like to see covered. Definitely. As you can see, Anthony is very knowledgeable on lots of different things. My email is anthony at rawmodel.com if you want to shoot me a direct email with questions and whatever. I do consultations as well. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, uh, that you also provide uh, consultation services, mm -hmm. private. Private, in-person. Do you do groups? I do groups, absolutely. Whatever someone wants to set up, it's all good. And how do they contact you? Anthony at rawmodel.com. And you can find me on Facebook as well. Mm-hmm, perfect. So uh, thank you guys for joining us on this first show. Yeah. And uh, we were very excited to talk about this because we didn't have any shows around this topic. So mm -hmm. uh, these topics. So join us uh, next week. Next uh, Saturday. It's going to be Saturdays at 4. Yes. And uh, we'll hopefully have uh, guests here with us mm -hmm. on Saturday. And sure. uh, we'll show you more, give you more information. Much love, everyone. And thank you very much. And patronize our sponsors. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you. Uh, 
All right, thank you.